Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and in this video we're going to watch segments from Big Bang Theory Season 1 to see how accurate all the science and technology in this season really was. What if she winds up with a toddler who doesn't know if he should use an integral or a differential to solve for the area under a curve? I'm sure she'll still love him. I wouldn't. <laughs> absolutely couldn't agree more. If you can't tell the difference between a differential and integral, that child is truly beyond loving. But the real answer to that is you use an integral to solve for the area underneath the curve. Well, it's just some quantum mechanics with a little string theory doodling around the edges. That part there, that's just a joke. It's a spoof of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. On Sheldon's board, it says FCNC, which stands for Flavor Changing Neutral Current. I promise you, I did not just make that up. What it's actually showing is the interaction between fermions, and being a theoretical physicist, it makes complete sense for that to be on his board. Leptons are electron, muons, and tau, as well as their neutrino versions, and quarks are the things that make up protons and neutrons. There are six flavors of quarks and leptons. For the positive, I believe they're up, charm, top, and then for the negative, they're down, strange, and bottom. I promise you, again, these are this is actually what the physics terms are. I'm not just making these up. There's arrows by a lowercase t by them, and that's not correct. They should be the Greek letter tau. A lowercase t in physics is a variable for time. There's quite a few of these overlaps, so that's why to avoid mix-ups, they use other variables or Greek symbols. And for example, in electrical engineering, we don't use the lowercase i for imaginary numbers. We use lowercase j. And the reason we don't use the i is because that's the variable that we denote for current. The Born-Oppenheimer approximation tells us that you can treat the wave functions of protons and neutrons much differently than the wave functions of electrons, because electrons have much smaller mass. This becomes way more apparent when you get to much bigger uh, molecules or elements, because now the differences between the nuclei and the electrons is way larger. Someone's tampered with my equations. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Look at the beta function of quantum chromodynamics. The sign's been changed. Noticed it when I got up to get a glass of water, so I fixed it. Now you can show that quarks are asymptotically free at high energies. Pretty cool, huh? Well, they're, they're, they're correct. It's all correct. And what they're discussing is within QCD, which is quantum chromodynamics, and that explores the interaction between quarks and gluons. As quarks come together, the energy between them decreases. And as they grow farther apart and become free particles, then the energy between them increases with the distance. And this interaction is called being asymptotically free. Now we've got an inclined plane. The force required to lift is reduced by the sign of the angle of the stairs, call it 30 degrees, so about half. Exactly half. <laughs> Exactly half. In Sheldon's defense, he's not wrong. It, it really is exactly half. And the reason for that is because the triangle form between the floor and the wall where the stairs connect up to is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And you can use Sokotoa, which is a, it's a trigonometry thing that was taught to, I think, a lot of people. So the first part of it is so, which is S-O-H, meaning sine of opposite over hypotenuse. And if you look at a 30, 60, 90 triangle, then the sine of the 30 degrees, the opposite is 1, and the hypotenuse, which is the longest side of the triangle, is 2. So sine of 30 is exactly half. It sticks. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Oh, you're just going to step right... Okay. <laughs> hey, Leonard. The hair products are Sheldon's. <laughs> okay. That is a really, really cool shower curtain. The elements on the periodic table are organized by rows based on atomic number, and then the columns are based on the orbits of their outermost electrons. There are still undiscovered elements, and they can be artificially created in the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, but the periodic table also doesn't account for dark matter and just whatever else in the universe that we don't know about yet. Come on, we have a combined IQ of 360. We should be able to figure out how to get into a stupid building. What do you think their combined IQ is? Just grab the door! People who have very high IQs often lack in other areas in life, such as common sense or street smart. Common sense in general is quite rare, but especially when you've been surrounded by academia and just protons and neutrons and leptons and quarks, you get so caught up in high-level STEM research that you can just forget everyday life and Girl Scouts will outsmart even theoretical physicists. This is not that uncommon. I'm trying to see how long it takes a 500 kilowatt oxygen iodine laser to heat up my cup of noodles. <laughs> 
I've done it. About two seconds. 2.6 for minestrone. <laughs> Heating up ramen like that will work. I'm not sure if the heat would be uniform, though. You'd probably have it really, really hot in the center of the cup, and then just the rest of it would get really cold as you went to the edges. It, there's no real advantage to this. A microwave is a way better option. I read an article about Japanese scientists who inserted DNA from luminous jellyfish into other animals, and I thought, hey, fish night lights. <laughs> All right, sure. Uh, glow-in-the-dark fish already exists. I mean, not like that glow-in-the-dark, but there are bioluminescence that exists naturally in certain animals, and you can just breed that trait over and over again so more and more generations of fish become more bioluminescent. Liquid nitrogen, 320 degrees below zero. <laughs> All right, there's there's no way. Uh, this will never be allowed in any lab. It's uh, no food because the crumbs can get everywhere. No loose clothing because something might get caught on something. Uh, new, no open-toed shoes. There's no shorts, no exposed skin because you, you can get burned or even like chemical burns are even worse. These rules are put in place to protect people. It looks like the only one she followed here was actually wearing the goggles. And that too is like, there, there's so much else wrong with this scene that this wouldn't happen. Don't forget his genetic predisposition towards addiction. That's never been proven. There have been studies. Not double blind studies. How could there be a double blind study? Who would be the control group? Well. All right, I guess that's a good point. Uh, a, a double blind study is where neither the participants nor the researcher actually know who's being given the real test or a placebo effect. So for example, imagine that there's a new pharmaceutical drug being tested and the placebo effect has been already very well established. So the researcher would give the real drug to one group and the placebo to another. But in a double blind study, the researcher themselves doesn't know which group got the real drug. Like so someone just said, here's a bunch of pills, give some there and give some there. But the researcher themselves doesn't know which group has the real one. And the reason you want to do it this way is because if the researcher was aware which group got the actual pill, then they might treat them a little bit differently, like make their questions more harsh or just whatever sort of natural bias would come of it. The double blind study would eliminate it because you can only go based off what the data shows. We're gonna need a strong fourth for our team. You know who's apparently very smart is the girl who played TV's Blossom. <laughs> she got a PhD in neuroscience or something. That's super cool! TV's Blossom is Amy Farrah Fowler. They talked about her in season one, but she didn't get on the show till season four. That, that's really cool foreshadowing. And the actor who plays her really does have a degree from UCLA in neuroscience. Yeah, I have a master's in engineering. I remotely repair satellites on a regular basis. I troubleshoot space shuttle payloads. <laughs> No, that baby's broken. <laughs> There's nothing you could do. That baby was broken. 